Hello everyone. Welcome to Brain Map. This seminar series is co-sponsored by P41 funded Center for Mesoscale Mapping housed in the Martino Center. Uh, today it's my great pleasure to welcome our speaker, Dr. Vadim Nikulin. Uh, Dr. Nikulin graduated with honors from St. Petersburg State University, Russia as a neuroscientist. Uh, later, he obtained his PhD in neuroscience in the University of Helsinki while doing research in biomed laboratory under the supervision of Risto Illuminemi. Uh, at the time, he was a part of the team that uh, pioneered TMS EEG research. He then moved as a postdoc to Karolinska Institute. Later, he was a postdoctoral researcher at the Bernstein Center for Computational uh, Neuroscience in Berlin. And after that, he became a principal investigator uh, at Charité University uh, and uh, also MPI, as far as I know. Um, at the time, he is a visiting professor of uh, at the Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience uh, at University of Moscow. And from uh, 2017, Vadim has been a group leader at the Max Planck Institute uh, in Leipzig. His current research projects relate to the investigation of uh, large-scale sp spatiotemporal neur neuronal dynamics, uh, particularly oscillatory activity in, re in relation to sensor motor tasks and cognition. Uh, his clinical uh, research is focused on Parkinson's disease and stroke. Uh, his research uses EEG, MEG, LFP recordings, and non-invasive brain, brain stimulation like TMS, um we also uh, develop uh, he also develops uh novel uh, multivariate algorithms for analysis of multi-channel eeg ME, meg and lfp data um i would like to re remind our audience uh, to please address the questions uh, using the q a box or raising their hands at the end of the talk if they have very urgent questions just let me know uh, <laughs> Nikulin, thank you very much uh, for coming here. The virtual stage is yours. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation and uh, very kind introduction. So I am very thrilled actually to present some of our research on the way how we can unite two of the most frequently studied phenomena in the human brain, not only in the human brain, but also in animal research. And that means neuronal oscillations and evoke responses. So I want to do it, I, I just want to present you two relatively big topics, which, will, which I will address in details. So I will start with an idea of unifying evoke responses and neural oscillations. The idea here is that at some point we should probably look at evoke responses and oscillation not as a separate phenomena, but possibly as stemming from one and the same source, particularly from neuronal oscillations. And I will do it using idea of baseline shift mechanism. And then I will switch to how pre-stimulus alpha oscillations relate to some other sensory responses and task performance. So that's also another way how we can unite oscillations and evoke activity. So now, so that we are with you on the same page, I would like to introduce uh, phenomenology of evoke responses. So as you know, an evoke response is a transient a time-locked and importantly phase-locked activity to a stimulus movement or specific task. So now traditionally, and there is no name associated with this model, people thought of evoke responses as being generated according to additive or evoke model. So what it means that at time zero, there is a stimulus, it produces an evoke response depicted here in red, and that writes on the top of ongoing constellations depicted here in blue. And in this scenario, evoke activity and ongoing constellations are in fact different processes. However, in 74, Sayer said, well, wait a minute, it could be a little bit more, compli more complex than that. So it could be that in fact, uh, evoke responses represent a phase reset of ongoing constellations. So in this scenario, there is no need to postulate additional activity which is produced by the stimulus it's rather a transformation, a phase reset of ongoing constellations, which are already there. So in this scenario, evoke activity and ongoing constellations actually represent the same process. And until this very day, there is a dispute in the literature, especially in human literature, whether, for instance, N100, P100 in auditory and visual domains, whether they are generated as additive responses 
or due to a phase reset mechanism. So it's an ongoing discussion in the literature. However, I would like to tell you that there is yet a third mechanism and it's called baseline shift mechanism. It's stunning that it has been overlooked for a very long time. It's based on very two simple prerequisites. And whenever these two prerequisites are met, you must have a work response. So now the first one is relatively simple. So what we say is that any stimulus task or cognitive activity should lead to amplitude modulation of ongoing constellations. Well, that's, we don't need really to prove it because by now thousands of studies show that, for instance, if you think of alpha oscillations or beta oscillations, whenever you have a task, they will always be modulated no matter what. So basically you can go now to your data and have a look what happens with your ongoing oscillations and you will most likely see that it's modulated in one way or another. Usually it's decreased during the task. However, the second prerequisite is a little bit more subtle. So what we are saying is that oscillations, ongoing oscillations neural, they should not have zero mean. So what I mean by this, here I show you two trials in antiphase and they are amplitude modulated, okay? So there is an attenuation of oscillations after zero. However, these oscillations have exactly zero mean and therefore after averaging, there is just a flat line. However, let us look at the scenario where ongoing oscillations do not have a zero mean. And what happens is that when the oscillations are attenuated and if they are averaged, there's two epochs in antiphase, then you have a residue. And this residue is nothing else but evoke response. So just to give it to you a little bit in a more formal way. So our um, uh, signal basically represents a cosine, which is amplitude modulated. But this cosine doesn't have a zero mean, meaning that this R term is not zero. So that means that there is an oscillatory part and then there is a T R part, which is an evoke response. So if I want to average across many epochs, as, I, as you can see here, so if I integrate over different epochs or over different neuronal populations, then what I will see is that my oscillatory part will average out, right? So because phases could be not necessarily aligned, especially if you make your triggers random, but there will be ATR term, uh, term which will remain. And this is a work response. And now look at this. It, it's not an additive response. There is nothing added to oscillations. There is no phase reset, not at all. It's just that the amplitude modulation of oscillations with non-zero mean automatically leads you to, work, to generation of work responses. So in order to measure it, we usually use so-called baseline shift index, and we will use it a lot. So BSI basically tells you how amplitude envelope of oscillations is scaling with a low frequency part of your oscillation. So meaning how AT times, which modulates oscillation, scales AT times R, which is a low frequency part. So basically what it means is that your oscillations simultaneously have envelope modulation and exactly the same modulation of the low frequency part, but they are not different processes. They are one and the same process. And therefore you can capture the relation between this baseline shift activity, like a DC like very slow activity and amplitude modulation of ongoing oscillations. It could be alpha oscillation, it could be beta oscillation, it could be gamma oscillation. So it's, it's quite a, a general principle. So now, just to mention to you that in the literature, there was also suggested by Ole Jansen and, and colleagues, uh, amplitude fluctuation asymmetry index, which just measures the asymmetry of oscillation with respect to zero line. And then it's expressed like this, like a variance of peaks and troughs. However, as we showed analytically in our paper, so be careful with amplitude fluctuation asymmetry because although it picks up asymmetry of oscillations, it is actually not very good as a, dis as a dis uh, descriptor of a non-zero mean. So if you really want to measure non-zero mean, you better use baseline shift index. So now just to briefly tell you that there are powerful predictions um, from baseline shift mechanisms. First one is that there should be a special similarity in the amplitude modulation of oscillations. And here you see some other sensory work fields, how they're generated and corresponding alpha amplitude modulation. There also should be a temporal similarity between time courses of evoke responses, in this case, at some other sensory evoke fields, and the modulation of alpha oscillations. And finally, there is even a more crazy thing. So if we measure baseline shift index in resting state before any stimulus is applied, then by measuring the relation between 
amplitude of alpha and or any other rhythm and the corresponding DC like activity, whether it's upward or downward going, we can actually predict what would be the polarity of evoke responses if these oscillations are attenuated. So on the left part, you can see that if oscillations are attenuated, it should lead to a negative going to evoke response. And if here the alpha or, or any other amplitude of oscillations is attenuated, it should lead to an increase. And as you can see here, we show that these predictions are extremely good. We can predict the polarity of work responses almost with 100% accuracy. And again, it's important we predict it from resting state dynamics. So now, of course, we wanted to push it further. We wanted to push it to conventional work responses, which are people recording typically with, for instance, in auditory and visual domain. So this is the work which we um, did with Luca Iemi. So here we were investigating the role of alpha oscillations and how they modulate visual work responses. So here we thought that there could be at least two different mechanisms how alpha oscillation can change uh, visual work responses. The first one is due to inhibitory nature of alpha. So we all know that one of the main ideas of alpha oscillations or at least the neurophysiological meaning of alpha oscillations is that they have that they are associated with inhibitory processes. And so what we reason that the very early uh, visual responses will be attenuated if alpha oscillations in pre-stimulus are very strong. So this is of course a schematic description of our hypothesis. However, due to baseline shift mechanism, we can also postulate that stronger ERD or stronger attenuation of oscillation should lead to larger evoke response, but at later times. So now stronger alpha should lead to a completely opposite effects on evoke responding, uh, on evoke responses, depending on the mechanism through which this evoke responses are generated. So now for early, it should be attenuation. For late, it should be an enhancement of our evoke response. So now just to tell you how we did it. So in order to measure the earliest visual work response, so-called C1 response, we used a special wedged uh, checkerboards, which produce a beautiful C1 response with a latency of about 70 milliseconds. And then there is, as you can see here, there is also a late response at about 400 milliseconds. And then of course, you also see a beautiful attenuation of alpha oscillations over occipital parietal area. So we have beautiful work responses and we have early and late parts of work responses. And we also have an amplitude modulation of alpha, right? So now, okay, now the first thing we immediately see is that if we sort alpha, as you can see here in figure C, to different bins, a very strong alpha in yellow and a very weak alpha in blue. So then the first thing you see is that indeed strong alpha is associated with the attenuation of uh, C1 response. And this is a very significant, uh, uh, this is a very significant result as you can see here with corresponding T values. And so basically that's indeed was uh, the case that what we see here is an attenuation of early work responses. So however, then what we wanted to, to see what happens with later work responses. We measured uh, in resting state, importantly, in resting state, we measured uh, the baseline shift index, meaning we measured the, uh, the basically the situation when we see non-zero mean of oscillation. And in this case, our mean of oscillations over these parietal areas was negative, right? So you can see here. And we know this, you remember that if there is a negative relationship between alpha oscillation and corresponding DC-like activity, the attenuation of alpha should lead to a, a stronger positive evoke response. And this is exactly what we observed. So for late evoke response, what you can see here that for stronger ERD depicted here in yellow color, you see a stronger response compared to situation when ERD is small. So again, as you can see here, pre-stimulus alpha affects generation of visual evoke responses in two very different way, ways. One is through inhibitory effect and the early responses are attenuated, but late evoke responses are rather enhanced. So therefore, if you want to understand how and what your evoke responses reflect, you really need to take into account what is the mechanism which is responsible for modulation of your evoke responses. So now, of course, the other thing we wanted to see, we wanted to see whether this non-zero mean of oscillations, which has been shown by now, I mean, in, in, uh, in, in a number of papers, both EEG and MEG papers, 
whether it could be obtained directly from biophysical modeling. And so we use this uh, beautiful toolbox developed by uh, Stephanie Jones and her group, a human neocortical neurosolver. And so basically, uh, the idea here is that we wanted to uh, change different parameters and uh, in the model and to see what is the parameter space where the resulting uh, 10 hertz oscillation or alpha uh, oscillations have non-zero meaning. So now this a very simple uh, idea just to show you the principle of how you unavoidably always get asymmetric currents is to show that when we have either primarily strong proximal input or primarily distal input to the pyramidal cells. So what you can see here is that, of course, because of the asymmetric place, placement of synapses, you always have currents flowing in a specific direction. And it's very hard to imagine a situation when these currents would be exactly counterbalancing each other. So this figure actually shows you what happens when there is a predominant uh, proximal input, and then you see a very strong upward going currents with non-zero mean downward with another way around downward going currents. And then this is the default values in the of the published model. Again, you see that uh, there is a no zero mean of oscillations. But of course, what we did, we systematically in a very extensive manner, we're changing different parameters in the model. We were changing density of potassium, sodium channels. We were changing synaptic weights of AMPA and NMDA receptors, lengths of apical dendrites. And what you can see here, that in 99.9% .9 of all kinds of parameter space, your oscillations never have zero mean. So they are anything but zero mean. So now that basically means that it is, even if you don't know exactly the parameters of the model and like exactly what it corresponds to real data, for a huge variety of uh, parameter space, basically for 99.9%, .9%, it always gives you a non-zero mean oscillations. So now, but there is another very important part to understanding uh, how um, this baseline shift mechanism works also in spatial terms. And this is the question I discussed with Mati Hamalani at some point. So now let's look, with, let's look uh, at, uh, at the presence of alpha sources in invasive um, data. So this is electrocorticogram where they had uh, a distance between electrodes of just few millimeters. And despite the fact that we have a massive volume conduction, what you see here is that the coherence drops very fast. Within six millimeters, it can drop by a factor of two. And that basically means that you have a lot of sources in the cortex, right? But it's not always that these sources are coherent, right? So that sometimes they, they are not necessarily phase locked, or they could be locked with different phase, meaning it, it, it could be not necessarily zero when you have a very strong power of oscillation. They could have an arbitrary phase lag, and then the macroscopic signal, which you see at the level of EEG or MEG signal, could be quite diminished. So just to show you, we did a simulation where we, for instance, imagine that we have a field electromagnetic from one neuronal population. So here you see an oscillation, then there is zero oscillation is attenuated, and then it goes again up. But now we have two different scenarios. So in one case, we have a high synchrony of uh, neuronal populations, with, for instance, between different macrocolons. So this is reflected in relative phase lag not being uniform. So you can see that there is a clustering of phase delay between different neuronal populations around zero lag. And then in another case, you literally have the same amount of alpha, the same number of neuronal populations. But now they're taking from a distribution where their relative phase uh, has a uniform distribution. So basically, there is a, a very massive constellation of phases of this oscillatory circles. So not surprisingly, if you see the summed up potential or magnetic field at the level of sensor, you see that in the case of very high synchrony, you have a beautiful attenuation of uh, oscillations, while in case of uh, asynchronous populations, you see a very little of attenuation. You see it's, it's hardly detectable. So now we have these two populations they lead to either very strong ERD or very small ERD, but what is important is the same number of uh, active populations producing alpha. Now I have a question to you. What do you think with the, will be with evoked responses? So now, the situation corresponding to high synchrony and to low synchrony, what would be the resulting uh, 
uh, evoke response due to baseline shift index. So please tell me, will it be a smaller, larger, like in what condition? So if somebody can maybe tell me, I will just wait maybe for five seconds if somebody is uh, through chat, maybe. Yeah. So please tell me because I don't see chat. Um, I will let you know uh, yeah. if there is any anything in the chat, mm -hmm. but uh, it might take a bit of time for people to write. Okay, now I, I just, um, I mean, it's just, I will just give a little spoiler or big spoiler. So actually there is no difference in generation of work responses. So now through baseline shift mechanism, spatial synchrony plays a huge role how you see manifestation of ERD, but not for evoke responses. We can understand it again, looking at the mechanistic expression. So we have oscillations, which are amplitude modulated. So now this oscillation, the AT times cosine, this is what will be canceled out or enhanced, but the ATR part is completely insensitive to the phase of oscillation. So what it means that whenever you measure a strong ERD or weak ERD, if you say, oh, okay, that should lead to stronger evoke response. And then you say that that should lead to weak evoke response. I just to show you that that's not unequivocally so, because if you don't have access to the information about the spatial synchrony of uh, oscillators, then it's very hard to make these predictions. So therefore we can derive following predictions from for this baseline shift mechanism. One is that when we have amplitude modulation of oscillation, there should be an evoke response. So I just showed you that sometimes amplitude modulation is not necessarily clearly visible. And that means that it, it's there, but it's hard to detect, but still evoke response is generated as you can see here. However, what I never seen, and this falls from this model, it's, it's impossible to see cases like this, that you would have a modulation of ongoing activity without any corresponding evoke responses. I never seen cases like this, it's a strong prediction from the model. If you see cases like this, please let me know because that would be stunning uh, to see this. Okay, so now basically what we want to do, we want um, in our next study, what we did already, not what we want, we already did it. We wanted to bind together two of the most frequently studied phenomena in the human brain. And this is P300 response. As you know, it's obtained in a ball paradigm when you have a, a sequence of standard and deviant stimuli and you have to respond to deviant stimulus. So it's a typical response um, for attention allocation, memory storage, context update, decision-making. And also we have a second phenomenon, which is alpha oscillations. And that relates to inhibition, attention, working memory. And oftentimes, I mean, sometimes people study them like oftentimes separately, sometimes together, but not really relating them in a, in a way that they could represent the same phenomena. So the idea which we had here, we wanted to show that, well, actually P300 could be uh, another way how we can look at alpha oscillations. So now basically in order to prove this idea that P300 is generated through baseline shift mechanism, we need to fulfill four prerequisites. First, there should be a temporal similarity between P300 and alpha oscillations. Two, there should be a spatial similarity between P300 generators and alpha source generators. So there should be, a, we should be able to predict direction of P300 from resting state uh, oscillations, like what you can see here, if in resting state you have a mean of oscillation being shifted a little bit downward, then the attenuation of oscillation should lead to a positive in, uh, to a positive uh, generation of a uh, evoke response. And the fourth condition is that there should be a functional relation, meaning if we have an improvement of memory with P300, we also should be able to see a similar improvement for the strength of ERD. Okay, so this four, we should show that all four conditions hold for us. Now, in order to do this, we took advantage of a live data set, populational data set in Leipzig. We have it's uh, about 2000 people. It's mostly elderly people, but they don't have neurological or psychological uh, psychiatric disorders at the moment of testing. Uh, so that was 32 channels. We had either resting state, 10 minutes or auditory oddball paradigm, a typical for P300. So I'm just immediately to show you the First case, so there is a, a huge, I mean, there is a beautiful temporal similarity between the evoke response P300, as you can see here, to, to a target stimulus 
and to attenuation of alpha oscillations. So they are beautifully kind of co in time. So that's the first prerequisite. So the second prerequisite, if, if we look at the strengths of P300 and ERD, and if you look at the corresponding topographies, then again, what we see is that this is a classic P3 and ERD topographies. And what you see is that they have, again, a beautiful similarity. And when you do source modeling for P300 versus attenuation of alpha oscillations, again, you see the stunning correspondence between evoke responses and attenuation of alpha sources. So now, okay, now we, as I told you, we also need to see a negative baseline shift index and alpha fluctuation asymmetry index over occipital parietal areas. And this is indeed what you see over electrode PZ and down, you see that your baseline shift index has a negative polarity. So meaning we measure it in resting state, then when the corresponding alpha oscillations are attenuated, the corresponding evoke response should go out. So, but we did something even more remarkable. So what we did, we took these 2000 subjects. We took the baseline shift index at resting state and we've been bin participants into different bins. So now these are the participants in the bin one who have a very negative BSI and then the other participants having more positive BSI. And then the, so, I mean, the, the thing which you expect of course is that the people with the most negative BSI measured at resting state should have the strongest P3. And that's indeed what we observed. You can see here, and the people with more positive, they rather have a diminished P300. So if you have these two curves, and if you then compare statistically where the largest spatial differences are, they immediately fall into the neighborhood of P300 uh, generators. So now you, you can see that also the the polarity the prediction of P3 from resting state dynamic holds very nice for this. And, if, and finally, in this, uh, in this um, uh, populational uh, huge data set, we also have a, a working memory, sorry, sorry, we have a cognitive performance task such as attention, which is married with TMTA part of Stroop, memory, CRAD delayed word recall, recognition delayed figure recall, and executive function with TMTB and Stroop incongruent measurements. So what you can see here is a correlation of this cognitive test with neurophysiological parameters, such as, for instance, alpha ERG latency peak and P300. So what you can see that they have a positive correlation with the executive function as, and with attention. And then you see anti-correlation for memory between P300 amplitude and the strength of ARD. So, and, and they must have a negative correlation because P3 is positive but uh, ERD is negative. So again, but the stunning thing is that I wanted to tell you that the neurophysiological parameters of P3 and alpha show similar directions with respect to cognitive performance. So this is the fourth uh, prediction for why we may think that at least in part P300 could be generated by the amplitude dynamics of alpha oscillations. So just to conclude, so I showed you that P3 and alpha modulation demonstrate similar time evolution, have similar spatial location, we can predict the sign from resting state and the corresponding to behavioral correlates. So all four prerequisites have been fulfilled. So now what the implication of it? Okay, now there, there have been ideas that P3 is associated actually with inhibitory processes, but because as we think P3 is generated by attenuation of alpha, then it rather could be associated with increased excitation. If you want to understand P3, it's better to study it together with alpha oscillations. So now currently we are showing and working on a, on a study showing that also other potentials, long latency potentials, such as for instance, readiness potential can also be generated through baseline shift mechanism. And I don't have time, but if there are questions, I can explain you how in fact phase amplitude coupling can be understood completely through the framework of baseline shift mechanism. So now I would like to switch to a second part of my talk, and that will be about, uh, again, again, relationship between ongoing constellations and evoke responses. But now it's, it will be focused on some other sensory, some other sensory field, and also would relate to a task performance in some other sensory task. So now, of course, I will be talking again a lot about alpha oscillation or mu rhythm in some other sensory domain. And of course, we know that it relates in a big way to inhibitory processes, right? And in our study together with Maria, so we indeed showed that the excitability, which you can measure with intracortical facilitation directly relates to pre-stimulus alpha oscillations. 
But in our work, we wanted to utilize also other, another biomarker of excitability, which could be even more precise and more neurophysiologically explainable than alpha oscillations. And I'm talking about early somatosensory work responses. Specifically, I'm talking about N20 response as a, as a response to median nerve stimulation, which is generated in contralateral area in some of the S1 and area 3B, as you can see here. And what is cool about this response that at this moment at uh, like 18, 20 milliseconds, it is only, only an excitatory input from, from thalamus terminating at a basal dendrites in, in pyramidal cells. So this time there are no other processes. It's, it's an excitatory processes. It's, it's, it's an excitatory potential. And what's important, if we can control in some way, in some magical way, the strengths of an input from thalamus, then any change in M20 can only result due to changes of in postsynaptic neurons. So meaning in, for instance, membrane potentials of pyramidal cells. So therefore it's a very unique indicator of excitability in the cortex and pyramidal cells. So now I want to show you how we use this um, probe in the form of N20 to test an idea that uh, particularly in some other sensory system, our neural networks operate at a critical state. So unfortunately, I don't have time to go at length for this, but there is this idea in physics that there is a, a phase transition, for instance, between uh, between a ferromagnetic, magnetic and non-magnetic, but then there is a critical temperature where, and then the similar idea of metastable state or critical state exists in neuronal networks. And you can understand it in a way as an intermediate state between excitation and inhibition. So this is a metaphor how we can think about this. So these are neuronal networks. And let's see what happens with neural networks as time goes by and what happens when we have different uh, probability of any other neuron to excite any other neuron in this network. As time goes by, if you have a very strong excitation in this network, there is a complete saturation of this network and no coding is possible. But you may have another situation when the probability of any neuron to excite any other is very small and then there is a complete cessation of activity. But you can imagine that there is a kind of intermediate activity of excitatory state where you have actually at exactly this critical state, uh, highest dynamic range information transmission and information capacity. So uh, the work of John um, Beggs actually showed very nice and beautiful uh, results from avalanche dynamics and in vitro studies. So, but however, you can also apply ideas of measuring criticality non-invasively. And for that, we use, for instance, so-called long-range temporal correlations, which is in a nutshell an outer correlation. It shows you how the, how the process is correlated with itself when being shifted by a specific amount of time tau. So it is not a proof of a critical state, but it is a cons it's consistent with an idea that the system might operate the critical state. So typically we measure it as an amplitude envelope um, uh, outer correlations in the amplitude envelope of oscillations. And if they attenuate slowly according to power law, that might be an indication that we, are, we might potentially have a situation with uh, this power law dynamics and maybe with some stretch with criticality. So typically we measure this long range temporal correlations with the trended fluctuation analysis, which gives you an exponent of 0.5 for completely white noise. And if you have persistent correlations, then it will be between 0.5 and 1 with a magical value one indicating that we are approaching the critical state. And there are very nice uh, modeling works by a group of Klaus Linkinka Hansen and others for this topic. So in the past, we used this um, LRTC and alpha oscillations to predict performance in sensory motor tasks, such as, uh, for instance, brain computer interface in decision making. And also we can predict from resting state the cognitive performance. We also published lots of papers on schizophrenia, depression, Parkinson, essential tremor, showing how criticality is important. But what's important for us today is to track this critical state and long-range temporal correlation in excitability of primary somatosensory cortices with N20. So now, how do we do this? So as I told you, um, so somatosensory work potentials uh, primarily would, changes in somatosensory work potentials would primarily reflect changes in postsynaptic uh, cells in the, in the in pyramidal cells in the primary somatosensory cortex. So this is just to show you that 
you can obtain a very refined source modeling to extract uh, just to show where your responses are generated. This is a classic tangential patterns, which we obtain with some machine learning. We use uh, uh, canonical correlation analysis to obtain canonical uh, spatial filters and to extract activity. Just to show you that, so this is quite crazy. So what I show you here on the left part, we extract single trials of N20 responses. So basically what you see here is that how in time with an interstimulus interval of 700 milliseconds, activity of uh, N20 is changing from stimulus one to stimulus 1000. And we can do it non-invasively single trial. We can track excitatory postsynaptic uh, currents in human cortex, non-invasively. And when you take a slice of this activity or like this, you can see that in time domain, let's say this is about 20 minutes data, there are fluctuations, there are fast fluctuations, but you can also see that there are slower fluctuations. And if you measure out the correlation function of this temporal dynamics, then what you see here is that the slopes of this line, which indicates the DFA exponents is different from 0.5, it could be even 0.7 which indicates that there are long range temporal correlations, meaning what happens in cortex now when we probe it is BZN20 will affect what happens in the cortex up to, for instance, 40 seconds later. And that's when we do it and average across many subjects and so on. What we see here, we see in the beautiful increase of long range temporal correlations, which we can probe non-visibly BZN20 response, okay? So now, of course, you can tell me, wait a minute, Vadim. So it could be that this is a projected variability from periphery or from thalamus. So what we did, we measured action potentials from median nerve stimulation at the biceps level. So basically, you can put electrodes close to biceps, and you can literally measure this beautiful action potentials from median nerve. And this is in red. But again, the DFA exponents are at, at the chance level. It's 0.5. So it's not from periphery. So I can also tell you that with uh, this machine learning uh, canonical correlation analysis, we can extract thalamic activity at about 15 milliseconds. And you can see a classic radial dipole. And again, we show that in thalamus, this activity, like the earlier somatosensory activity, doesn't show long range temporal correlation. So that basically means that the criticality we observe is primarily at the level of a cortex itself. So now another very, very paradoxical result we obtained was the following. So now you see N20. Now let's zoom in into N20 and see how the amplitude of N20 changes as a function of pre-stimulus alpha oscillations. So now what you see here, the stronger are your oscillations, the larger is N20, okay? So now think about it. Stronger alpha oscillations lead to stronger evoked response. So this is completely opposite to what people usually think in literature. They think that stronger alpha leads, for instance, to you missing stimuli, not so good stimulus detection, also typically with attenuation of awoke responses. But now what I show you here, it's another way around. So you have strong alpha, you also have very strong, no, you have stronger N20 responses. So how can we understand it? Actually, if you are a neurophysiologist and if you know what is the equilibrium potential, it is quite straightforward to explain. So let us consider the left situation when we have a membrane potential of pyramidal cells minus 70 millivolts. So now when we have, uh, for instance, a glutamatergic input, so what happens is that there will be a postsynaptic membrane currents, which is proportional to the membrane poten uh, potential, right? So we have a relatively strong current. So now let's think what happens when membrane potential moves toward depolarization, let's say when it's 60 millivolts. So it is true that it's easier to excite the neuron, right? So you are depolarized, it's easier to excite you, but the corresponding current is very small, meaning that if we would move it even closer to equilibrium pot uh, uh, potential for sodium, then the, there could be even reversal of the current, okay? So now, and on the contrary, when we have a very strong or like a hyperpolarized state, I would say minus 80 millivolts, this is a very strong electrochemical gradient. And by so basically what it means is that the resulting currents will be very strong. So this is actually the way how we can explain that N20 is getting larger when alpha is stronger. 
And it's indeed a nice way to confirm that alpha might be might correspond to inhibitory state to more hyperpolarized state of pyramidal cells. So in a way, they're confirmatory to each other. So kind of like the idea of alpha being inhibitory and N20 being enhanced in, in strong prestimulus alpha. But now, of course, so it's it's all very nice that we detected these early changes in N20. We show that we can track them on a single trial level. Now the next question, whether changes in N20 have a functional meaning. So as you probably know, those people who study uh, summer sensory system, for 30, for 30 years, people were trying to figure out or to find an evidence that the earliest summer sensory responses such as N20 would be in some way relating to cognitive performance. And it was, I mean, there, there was no evidence basically. So what we wanted to do here, we wanted to do the following. So it's a, it's a sensory, summer sensory discrimination task. So the, the people are getting median nerve stimulation every, let's say, 700 or every one second. And then there is a median nerve stimulus, and then there is slightly weaker median nerve stimulus. So yeah, they are not very clearly distinguishable. And your task is to discriminate whether it was a strong or weak stimulus, OK? It's whether it was a strong or weak median nerve stimulation, which is a quite challenging task, depending on how you adjust uh, stimulation intensity. And again, so we used our techniques to extract single trial in 20. So you can see here again, we succeeded in extracting these beautiful responses. And now our question was what we wanted to do. We wanted to relate to, to each other. On the one hand, pre-stimulus alpha oscillation, as you can see here, we wanted to relate the amplitude of, of, of N20, and we wanted to relate it to behavioral performance. Moreover, again, we of course control for peripheral measures. So we want to make sure that our peripheral measures are super stable and so there is nothing kind of uh, funny going on there. And so now what we did for this, we use a structural equation modeling. And what you can see here is the following. So first of all, pre-stimulus alpha oscillations uh, relate to perceived stimulus intensity in a negative way, meaning and that's what we also know from previous papers is that stronger alpha oscillations correspond to, uh, to you not perceiving strong stimulus as strong, but rather as weak stimulus, okay? So now what we also can see is that the stimulus alpha oscillations relate in a negative way to initial cortical responses. And this is what I just explained to you. So meaning that stronger alpha oscillations rather lead to smaller magnitude of N20 response because of this uh, uh, equilibrium potential logic. But now look at this. There is this also kind of from the first side paradoxical positive correlation between N20 and perceived stimulus intensity. Positive, but please remember that N20 is a negative response. So basically what it means, it means that the smaller N20 response corresponds to stronger perception so that you're more likely to perceive uh, weak stimulus as strong. So now I explained to you why it could happen. Basically that weaker, uh, weaker N20 corresponds rather to a, to a state of a strong excitatory pre-stimulus state. And this is how we explain how weak, weaker some other sensory work responses can lead to stronger perceptual consequences. And this actually changes challenges all the previous understanding of how people typically equate evoke responses to perceived, uh, for instance, stimulus intensity. Typically, typically people think that stronger stimulus should lead to stronger evoke response. So, but now but with this, what we show that sometimes actually the weaker evoke response could lead to a stronger perception of a stimulus. So now, and what we also showed, of course, that neural excitability shapes perceived stimulus intensity already at the very first cortical response. So we already can see evidence for how you will perceive a stimulus from the very first cortical evoke response, in this case, N20. So now the next thing we were interested in, in like this phenomena, which we observed on modulation of uh, early somatosensory evoke responses by corresponding some other sensory oscillations, whether it has a global character or whether it has a local character. So what I mean by this is that, for instance, if you stimulate median nerve and tibial nerve, and they have a very, very distinct uh, spatial somatotopia in the somatosensory cortex, 
whether the effects of pre-stimulus alpha oscillations will be the same for both tibial and median nerve evoked responses. But however, if they have a somatotopic character, that would mean that we can use, the brain can use alpha oscillation to selectively modulate excitability in different uh, somatotopic projections so that flexibly adjust, adjusting to different behavioral requirements. So again, we did this uh, peripheral nerve stimulation in an, in an alternating fashion. So we stimulated both median nerve and, and the tibial nerve, but like concurrently. And what you see here, again, we extracted this beautiful somatosensory work responses. And the first thing we did, we did a structural equation modeling, so-called cross, uh, cross term uh, structural equation modeling, where we wanted to see whether N20 responses from hand area modulate only its own responses in time, like those outer correlations, which I was talking about, or whether they can also affect the processing in a foot area. So what we observed, again, in agreement with our previous study, that we have these outer correlations, meaning that N20 in hand area now affects evoke responses later down the road. And P40 responses affect uh, later P40 responses. However, interestingly, we could not find any relation between modulation of hand area responses to food and vice versa. So this is a healthy brain. So it's really would be very interesting, Maria, to see how this would relate to, for instance, stroke case, where we have um, a problem with lateral inhibition, whether these terms, these cross terms would, would appear here, okay? But now the next question of course was, okay, now what about this relationship between pre-stimulus activity, alpha and evoke responses? And luckily for all of us, I guess, we have a very somatotopically organized effect of pre-stimulus activity on evoke responses, meaning that median nerve evoke responses are primarily modulated by alpha oscillations generated in the hand area and the foot evoke responses are primarily affected by alpha oscillation generated in foot area. So this in turn allows us to use alpha oscillations to flexibly change uh, excitability in a somatotopically specific manner according to specific behavioral uh, demands. So now just to summarize, so the temporal dynamics of early SCPs are likely to reflect critical dynamics as shown in oscillations, but now we confirm it with probes in the forms of SCPs. So we also show that cortical excitability influences how stimuli are perceived from the earliest cortical processing reflected for instance in N20. And a relation between pre-stimulus alpha and the evoke responses has rather a somatotopic uh, character and not the global character. So uh, with that, I would like to mention my colleagues who contributed to different parts of the studies I presented, funding, and I'm looking forward to, to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nikolin, for this very interesting talk. Um, I would like to remind our audience, please ask the, their questions by raising their hands and uh, having a, a writing into the Q&A box. Um, I would like to just also mention that actually uh, there were some uh, answers uh, or there were some people who were, who were trying to answer, but apparently chat box is disabled today. So please ask your questions through the Q&A box if chat doesn't work. Uh, we already have a question uh, from Maria. I also have questions, but uh, I will ask later if uh, yeah. I permit. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Maria, please go ahead. I actually uh, enabled your... Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for a beautiful talk, like like, like always. Uh, I actually uh, uh, wonder now when you when I think about the modulation of oscillations and um, its more possible relationship to modulation of the ERP, could we make a prediction uh, that uh, modulating oscillations using RTMS or TACS, as we know that we can do this, that we can have a very concrete prediction how it will affect the ERPs. And like in this case, you can kind of, you know, more or less prove that you really can uh, modulate oscillations using uh, non-invasive brain stimulation, which is still a doubtful topic. This is the first question. And the second question I was, yeah, the, 
I'm very fascinated by this uh, work about the difference of uh, like no relationship between N20 and P40. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think it's exactly, I think it's, even it's about S1. Um, I, I wonder how much it may actually be translated to the motor cortex because like sensory, somatosensory and motor, uh, the somatotopy is different. And oh, what do you think also about this possibility of uh, somatotopically influencing different part of the uh, uh, sensory sensory motor cortex using non-invasive brain stimulation. Yeah, thank you. Very very nice neurophysiologically inspired uh, question. So about modulation, yes, absolutely. That's what we showed. So if you can, for instance, upregulate alpha oscillations, right, with inhibitory RTMS, so then potentially it should lead to stronger stronger ERD and correspondingly to stronger visual evoke response. So therefore it's a directly testable thing. So in principle, if we would in, in some way, I mean, but you also know Maria that many people try to see upregulation due to RTMS. I mean, not everybody finds it, how exactly it's manifested is difficult, but okay, let's take an easy case and, and consider that all works as we think it works, right? The easy case. And then if we upregulate alpha, then it leads to stronger ERD, then yes, those uh, results which I showed you with Luca, we obtained should lead to stronger evoke responses. Absolutely so. However, it, it, it is not so simple because I showed you that the, because of spatial synchronization, sometimes the, the relation between, evoke, uh, between oscillations and evoke responses is, is not so simple. But yes, what you said is, is something we actually had in mind to upregulate or downregulate and to show that your evoke responses are changing. It's important then to indicate that it's not also due to the fact that your reactivity of, of corresponding cortical areas is changing. But Maria, I also wouldn't like to sound too simple-minded, meaning that it's not that we explain everything through baseline shift mechanism, not at all. We just said that there should be a considerable contribution from this specific mechanism. And it could be that you have a combination of different evoke responses. You have an additive responses, they are riding on the top of some baseline shifts, and this is actually what we showed. You may have additive baseline shift. They will interact. They will add to each other in some way. So therefore, we should be just careful uh, like with interpretation. Yeah. And the second one, yes. Like uh, when I was preparing this talk and again, looking at this and looking at our recent with you TMS motor mapping studies, right? With a uh, training individual finger movements. I was like thinking, wow, like, the, the, at least NS1 in normal healthy young volunteers, there is a, such a tremendous delineation of how evoke responses are not affecting other areas. Like it, it's really stunning. We couldn't find any, any evidence at all. So therefore, like to me, what would be interesting, Maria, for instance, to do motor mapping in these people and to see to what extent, uh, let's say they are uh, like, in, in some people we have more overlap and some less, and then to see how it would translate to this uh, finding we have with some other sensory work response. And as, as I told you, of course, stroke patients, stroke patients, like to see how this, uh, in some other sensory field, how the recovery follows this uh, lack of uh, crosstalks, right? So that we, I expect we will have crosstalks, but during the recovery, this crosstalk would kind of disappear. So that's, uh, let's see. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I, I think that, um, you know, leg and arm or leg and hand is like more, I mean, we know that they are much more delineated. So it will be also really interesting just to see not only medial nerve and tibial nerve, which are far away, but like something like radial nerve and ulnar nerve, yes. which you can clearly yes. separate peripherally. Yes. And it would be very interesting like to do this in mm. healthy and then mm. in dystonia on stroke patients. Yeah, so, to yeah I think. Totally, but that's of course, like the closer projections are, the, the harder it will be to separate sources. Of course, there are, it comes with some caveats, right? So, but yes, yes, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We have another, more. thank you. We have another question, Janet, please. Um, uh, yes. Um, earlier, when you were speaking about the P300 and alpha, uh, and you were talking about the implications of uh, shifting um, the baseline, you mm -hmm. suggested that you could comment on the face amplitude coupling yes. and baseline shift mechanisms. 
Yes, uh, absolutely. I would appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm just looking at the, yeah, exactly. I mean, maybe I can just, yeah, okay. So let's look at this, even at this uh, part. So now, okay, so what you see here in the, in the, in the bottom is that there is a modulation of uh, activity, okay? Like a sinusoidal activity. But this AT times R, this is a very low frequency phase, for instance, going upward. And now look, when this evoke response goes upward, but it could be this ATR times chow. Uh, like imagine that cosine here is gamma. Okay, just imagine that cosine is gamma. And AT is theta. Okay. Yes. AT is theta, theta. So now basically what you can directly show that there will be amplitude modulation of uh, of your gamma oscillations, which will be locked to the face of theta because ATR will be pure theta, just theta. So you see, basically you don't introduce explicitly theta here. Theta comes up as amplitude modulation of oscillations, which don't have zero mean. You see, you don't need two processes. If you are measuring the same population, you basically say, I only need my beta oscillations, gamma oscillations, and the only thing I require that my oscillations don't have zero mean. If they don't have zero mean, any amplitude modulation of just this gamma without any theta, but gamma is modulated by, uh, by, by the frequency of theta, right? The amplitude modulation. It would immediately give you this AT times R term, which is theta, and it will be phase locked to the amplitude modulation of gamma. So this is how you can think about Simpler, simpler. You don't need two processes. It's the same process in a way. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Seppo has a question. Hello, Seppo. <laughs> Hello, Vadim. Thank you for the fascinating talk. This is very nice. Uh, I just wanted to ask about the uh, how important is the averaging over trials for this uh, method to work, or can you? Yeah. Look at single trials, APT. Absolutely, a uh, beautiful question. And that's actually what I back then discussed also with Martin, who told me, hey, how can you explain single trial evoke responses, right? So now you don't need necessarily to average because let me show you here. So we are at the right figure. Okay, so imagine that what you see here is not many trials, it's just a population of neurons. And what I show here is the, the distribution of population of neurons, how they are locked to each other. And what I'm measuring here, this is a single trial ERD and evoke response. So you see, you don't need, in order to, uh, to obtain this baseline shift mechanism, you don't even need to average trials for that because averaging can happen as a result of summation of fields from different populations. And that's, of course, what we typically have. EEG, MEG, it's a summation of uh, thousands of macro columns, right? And this is exactly this. So you see, you here you have a walk response. I show you here on the left lower part. And this is a walk response, but you don't see much of oscillations here, right? There are some, but not much. And, and on the right part, we know it's generated by oscillations, but you don't see any trace of oscillation in single trials. So meaning, in order to have this beautiful bump, you don't need always to see necessarily oscillation or average them over many epochs. It, it is directly visible and obtainable through one epoch only, but because of spatial summation, superposition of, of many um, uh, populations, activity from many populations. That's great, thank you. Does it make sense? Do, 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 uh... Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Seppo. Uh, there, there is an anonymous question. Uh, do the IFO oscillations cause local inhibition or are they sign of inhibitory activity? <laughs> very good. Very, 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 very good question. Uh, uh, I mean, the evidence so far is that they are rather sign of an inhibitory activity. So there, are this, there is a handful of studies where they try to relate alpha oscillations to spiking activity. And the evidence is not very strong, meaning it's, I mean, if anything, alpha phase would be modulating. But again, nowadays there is this replication crisis with alpha phases. So the previous papers 
trying to replicate uh, a special perception of stimuli, weak visual stimuli, depending on phase. I mean, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work hard. So with power, the relation to spiking is hard. So everything we see is rather that, I would say alpha oscillations are an indication of inhibition. Although in some models, the way alpha is generated is indicative that the alpha itself would have traces of inhibition, of course. Yeah, I mean, but of course, alpha generation often depends on the activity of inhibitory cells itself, right? So therefore, in, in, in some way, of course, they also reflect inhibitory activity through this. But we should think about it as a network effect, not just, I mean, the signal comes from, from pyramidal cells, but it always reflects a network effect of inhibitory cells. But to me, it's mostly a sign of inhibition. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I have one last question and uh, then I will uh, end. Couldn't re resist to ask the question. Please go on, I'm uh, for, happy to. Yeah, we are a bit over time, but that should be okay. Um, so uh, as you said, I mean, it is very interesting to see actually a, a decreased uh, evoked response and a better perception, if you, if you want to say. Uh, why do you think that is the case? Or how how can how could you explain it functionally? Mm -hmm. So basically, the point is that uh, okay, if you consider that, for instance, pyramidal cell should be activated, uh -huh. okay, yeah, and then when pyramidal cell is activated, it sends, for instance, uh, through through its exons uh, something uh, the the information to other upstream areas, okay, yeah, and, and all I'm saying, you would probably agree that. If you are in a highly excitable state, okay, yeah. let me let me just show you this one. If you're in a highly excitable state, I'll show you here. If you're in highly excitable state, this is the middle ground. You mm -hmm. move from minus 70 to minus 60 millivolt, okay? Yeah. So it's very easy to, to generate spike in this cell. Very easy. You just push a little bit. Yeah. But now look at this, because your electrochemical gradient is not very strong. Your current is very weak. Mm -hmm. So what it means is that you will have tremendous spiking. And the corresponding response will be very small because it's proportional to postsynaptic current. You see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and another way around, if you are strongly, like if there is a strong, uh, like hyperpolarization, your response is big. However, to bring this cell up to firing, it re would require a lot of like activation. So that's why sometimes when you are at the highly excitable state at the neuronal network, your current could be small because you're already so close to, uh, ah. to spiking threshold. Ah, okay. That's how. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Now I understand. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. For well, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's uh, It's been a pleasure. Yeah, it was great. Uh, thank you very much. And for our audience, see you next week. Yeah, thank you. See you. Ciao.